All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we are live. I'm joined today by Deacon Patrick Mitchell. And uh, Deacon Mitchell is a person that I'm honored to say I met twice in person. We met uh, and had a good conversation initially about geopolitical stuff. We had uh, a little bit of a discussion on theological stuff. And then I met him again at a party and we had a really good time uh, with Jim Jatra. So really honored to have uh, uh, Deacon Patrick Mitchell with me. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, you guys can probably imagine why we have him with us today. And it's because there's a lot of really wild stuff being pushed in the Orthodox Church uh, of late, and this is one of the key hot button issues. In my estimation, there's other things going on as well. This is kind of a, 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 a issue to lead us into, to kind of wedge us into other issues on the part of certain people that are pushing these things. But there's nobody better to cover this topic than uh, Deacon Patrick, who does have not just a book on the Deaconess issue, which we'll get into, but he also has works critiquing origin. Uh, critiquing the erroneous sort of biological anthropological mistakes in origin that did affect uh, some of the patristic thinkers and writers. And I was really impressed when I heard his paper uh, a few years ago critiquing this. So I'm glad to see that it was turned into the book Origins of Revenge. And, um, but today we're going to be talking first about this issue of the deaconess. And maybe, you know, I, I did have Father John Wyford on and we did a brief, uh, you know, 20 minute discussion of this. So really glad to have you because this is kind of your, you know, you're really, I mean, you're not just this issue, but you're really well focused and studied on this topic. Let's just ask the basics here. Why, first of all, why are we all talking about deaconesses all of a sudden? And then what is the issue and why is it a big deal to point out that it's not really orthodox? Well, there's been a big push on. Uh, there's an organization called the Center for the Deaconess. Um, and um, it's been very active for a number of years. They've sponsored conferences and published papers. And in fact, I spoke at one of their conferences about six years ago, 2017. Um, and, uh, and they now have, uh, well, some support from uh, bishops, um, mostly Greek bishops, uh, who've been rather solicitous towards their ambitions. Uh, and, uh, and I think with the Greek bishops being as daring as they are, around the world, especially here in the United States, is that the, 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 the proponents of uh, deaconesses think that, well, if they just push a little harder, they can get them here before too long. Uh, and so, yeah, a push is on. Um, uh, recent conferences and whatnot, uh, Carrie Frost, the president of the uh, Center for the Deaconess, St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess, published her own book, um, uh, or a vision of uh, her, her church, what she thinks the church ought to look like last year. Uh, and, um, and I reviewed it. Uh, and uh, that in its sense uh, in, uh, probably brought her more attention than any other publicity she'd done because uh, it did get quite a bit. My review got quite a bit of attention. Uh, it's a scandalous book in a way because uh, it's just so unorthodox. In fact, she's extremely critical of the Orthodox Church. Uh, she's just, just uh, you know, the, from beginning to end, her complaint against it is that it's ruled by men. And that's terrible in her view. And she just ignores so much of Christian teaching um, in the Bible, in the, in, in the Fathers, um uh everything we say about it practically uh the only things that she'll even bother to quote in her book are the things that help her cause or the things that justify her criticism of the church there uh, and so that's where we've been for the last year uh and then ancient faith uh got involved in ancient faith radio and they interviewed me we had a great talk with father thomas soroka uh and uh and then well you know they had to pay some attention to the other side and so uh, just the last week or so they uh they um, um, aired a documentary uh, with interviews from both sides, not including me, but then they'd already talked to me. Um, and, uh, and that was uh, quite interesting there. Um, and actually, I think it came down rather favorably on the side of um, caution that this is not something that uh, we really needed to have now because it would be so controversial and because there's no real need for it since there's nothing they've identified um, that women need to do that need to uh, need to be ordained for. Um, and uh, so that's where we are now. I, I was actually rather pleased with the way the, the documentary turned out, ended up. Uh, very, uh, very appreciative of Father Thomas's uh, part in that because he helped sort of balance it out and keep it on track. Uh, and in the end, he and the other host, um, 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 is it John Maddox? 
um, who had put the, the uh, documentary together, did end up agreeing on the, the, the main conclusions there. So I thought that was good. And of course, the folks at St. Phoebe Center were not at all happy about it. And I'm sure they'll continue their work and will continue having to educate people on the issue there so they're not taken in by uh, the advocates of deaconesses. Uh, but it does raise, raise the bigger issue, which is um, uh, addressed in my book on Origins Revenge and also some other writing and speaking I've been doing. And, uh, and that's what, something we really do need to talk more about eventually, that the church itself needs to clarify this issue uh, now in a way that it hasn't needed to until now. Uh, the, the, the ancients were so accepting of the tradition that they didn't really question it as much as they could, and they didn't want to probe in, into any mystery that they didn't have to probe into. But now we're called upon to actually come to a better, clearer understanding of things consistent with what we received. And part of that is, as you mentioned, identifying those those aspects of originism that, that are a part of some fathers, not many, but some in the past that might still influence our thinking on male and female, certainly are still being used uh, by the advocates of deaconesses or the, by the advocates of many other things right. uh, in order to un yes, undermine the church's teaching on male and female. Uh, but there are much better ways of talking about it. And I put forth one in uh, book and Origins Revenge and some uh, other talks. My talk at the St. Phoebe Center also talked about this that do, I think, put uh, the whole issue on a, a different plane, a much more secure base that is plainly patristic, biblical, uh, patristic, apostolic, using the words of scripture and, and, and the apostles and the fathers to explain male and female in a way that, that doesn't denigrate women and, and yet uh, still does justify the difference role, different roles that God has assigned to us. Yeah, that's well put. Let's let's talk about the uh, patristic era. So, you know, what we often hear from um, people that want this to be the case nowadays is that there's this equivalence. Well, it was the exact same thing between men and women back at that time. Women had a, a, a similar role to men in the diaconate. Um, I had Father John Wyford on, and of course he went into some of the distinctions between the ordination of a deacon and that role versus someone who is operating in the role of a servant. And perhaps, uh, you know, via Romans 13, this was this is not what Father John was saying, but I, I was thinking about the fact that uh, the emperor is called uh, diakonos in Romans 13. That doesn't mean that every emperor or empress, uh, you know, is necessarily then part of the uh, sacramental sacerdotal uh, ministry. So what about the ancient origins of the term and the distinctions there and the arguments that they're putting forward that this really is an old role for women? Yeah, the word, it all comes down to the, Paul's use of the word diakonos uh, with regard to St. Phoebe. Uh, and that influences also our interpretation of other verses there. Uh, but because the word diakonos came to mean deacons, you know, it was a general Greek term for a sort of trusted servant, uh, rulers, as you mentioned, and that's one I also, also mentioned too, he's, he's called a diakonos of God, uh, a deacon of God, but nobody translates it that way. A minister of God is a common translation. In fact, minister was the ancient Latin translation. And that also means a sort of trusted servant. We think of it now in terms of a priest, but in English, but uh, but that means the priest serves on behalf of a magister, a bishop, and magister is where, where we get the word master, and that's what we call our bishops, master. Uh, so that's where the priest gets this idea of being called a minister. Um, but it was used generally for any trusted servant. Uh, the, the folks, the, the wine stewards at the wedding feast in Cana were called diaconoi. Uh, St. Paul calls himself a diaconos. Uh, he calls our Lord a diaconos. Uh, the apostles, when they appoint the first seven men, they talk about the diaconia, the daily diaconia or, or ministrations or service of distributing aid to the uh, widows of the church. But they also talk about their own diaconia, the diaconia of the word, which is what they want to concentrate on. And that's why they appoint the, the seven to do something else there. Uh, but every diaconia does not make you a deacon terminologically. Um, in Greek, of course, the two uses continued. And so it's not always clear uh, when Greek writer, ancient writers are writing, whether they're talking about deacons of the church or simply trusted servants of some kind. Uh, we usually judge that by context. And that's what we do with the New Testament. The New Testament, you read all the many uses of diakonos. The only times it used to be 
translated as deacon was in reference and went into a company with a talk about bishops. And so you have St. Paul in 1 Timothy talking about first what a bishop should be, and then he turns to talking what deacons should be. And there it's quite clear that he's talking about an office in the church. Um, and it's when he throws in a mention of women while he's talking about deacons that has people thinking, oh, he's talking about women, female deacons there. But there are other ways of understanding that. And by and large, in the West, among non-Greek speakers, that was not an issue. Nobody really thought he was talking about deaconesses there. The West had no tradition of deaconesses, only in the East. And, and really, I think only over time did they begin to uh, uh, associate this word more with the office of deacon and, and therefore have to include Phoebe in that office uh, and then some others than, uh, than thinking of it as a, a more of a simply a lay ministry, somebody who's helping out, somebody who's doing some real good for the church. Uh, and, uh, no matter where you were, there were women who were active in various ministries. But again, that doesn't mean that they were deacons. Um, uh, it does get to that point in the East. And uh, you know, I think we see the first signs of that in the third century with the Didascalia Apostolorum, the teachings of the apostles. An anonymous work, we don't know who wrote it, but it comes out of Syria and all our early works about deaconesses do come out of that area there. Uh, and, it, and it sort of pushes the idea of deaconess and it, it sort of exalts the female deaconess to a level that uh, we don't see else, elsewhere, really. It says that, well, it, it borrows an analogy that St. Ignatius makes uh, saying that we should honor the uh, bishop as, as God and the, uh, interestingly, and the deacons as Christ and the apostle, uh, apostles as, um, uh, da, 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 oh no, oh, oh the, uh, yeah, the priests, he says, as apostles. But then he says we should honor the, uh, then the Didascalia says, but not St. Ignatius, says we should honor the deaconess as the Holy Spirit. Uh, which you just don't find anywhere else. And uh, it's, it's rather, it's a dubious analogy, very dubious analogy. Uh, and yet it's there. And then before long, within a year, within a hundred years, you get uh, a historical deaconesses. Um, the first ones that appear are actually heretical deaconesses that we know of. Those are the ones who are talked about at the first ecumenical council. They're uh, polytionous deaconesses. And the question is, what do we do with them when they come back into the church? And the decision was, well, they're going to be lay women. Um, you know, it's not clear quite why they came to that conclusion, but that was it. Still, by the end of that century, the fourth century, deaconesses are an undisputed feature of the Orthodox Church in much of the East. Uh, so you have legislation in the 390s um, by St. Theodosius, the emperor, uh, governing, actually setting the, 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 the limit on age for women, actually setting this, the bar. They had to be 60 years, according to his initial rule, it was later lowered to 40 and 50. But um, but you also had, of course, known deaconesses such as St. Olympias, who's a friend of St. John Chrysostom, and the assumption on Chrysostom's part that she's a deaconess and then the church has always had deaconesses because he's also reading Romans 16 and seeing that Phoebe was a diaconos and assuming that, well, uh, she was a diaconos like the, or deaconess like the deaconesses he knew then. And that's the question, is that were they? Uh, were were they uh, the, uh, the fully members of the, or of the minor clergy at least? Yeah. Even in the century. And, well, that yeah, that was so the, the the passage that we often see, right? Romans sixteen, it says, "I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, servant of the church in uh, Sincrea." Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so is that the? the passage i mean the, i'm not i'm not aware of other passages in the new testament where i mean we have you know in acts that talks about the holy spirit coming upon uh certain women but there's not any other passages in uh, the new testament are there that are sort of part of this dispute no no well no nobody makes that connection um the the only other passages you know if you believe if you're reading in greek and and you're seeing this word and you see and you already know that well, deacons or diaconos is uh, an office in the church. And then you see it said that Phoebe is a diaconos. A lot of Greek speakers would simply assume that, well, I guess she was. Um, and then it begins to be a way that you interpret other things. Uh, for instance, in the second century, Clement of Alexandria, he's actually commenting on, he's making a defense of marriage. And he points out that the apostles had wives. 
and traveled with their wives. And he says, and of course, those wives assist them, assisted them in their ministry because they could go where men could not. They could go into the women's chambers and evangelize the women there. And I'm sure he's right. I'm sure that's what they did. They ministered to those women in that way. And he actually calls them sin diaconos um, uh, uh, with the apostles, uh, with the deacons, in a sense. Um, and so you see him thinking that he's he's bar, he's using this term uh, just to uh, describe somebody who's helping out in the ministry, not Absolutely. somebody who's ordained and actually, um, you know, fulfilling a formal role or has any authority in the church, but some simply somebody who's helping out in very valuable ways. And yeah, and uh, so when you got into that the patristic text, the would you say the Didascalion is one of these texts? Right. And you, are you saying that that text is using a misinterpretation, equating all of these? Is that well, what they're, they're, they're both, they're both coming out of, they're both from Greek speaking areas, uh, making this assumption, making this connection between deacons and Phoebe and then to other women. Uh, and, uh, and what we see the difference is, the key difference is because the way Clement of Alexandria in the second century talks about it, uh, he talks about it in a much more general sense. He uses that term diaconos of women in a general sense of helping out. But later in the, in the early third century, we get the didascalia making it sound much more like a clerical office there. He doesn't, they don't say that the, the document, and we don't know who wrote it again, and it's not, um, so I, I wouldn't call it patristic literature because it's not associated with any father that we know of. Is it, is it pseudepigrapha or? Yes, it's, it's pseudonymous. Uh, we don't know who wrote it. And, uh, you know, parts of it uh, were later reworked into the apostolic constitutions in the next century. And, and that work was condemned by the uh, the council in Trullo in 692 because it, for certain works that they thought clean, contrary to piety was the words. So yeah. did this document that we're talking about here, you were saying that it did establish in places of the East the ministerial it, understanding of women or just it, the it, servant it, understanding? If it didn't establish it, and I really doubt that it established it so much as it encouraged it, and and it was probably a thing already sort of happening, uh, because you have this assumption making. Origen also about the time that they got Didascalia is written. Origen is also commenting on Romans Romans sixteen and and saying this means that she was a deacon. Um, oh, I see. Even earlier, yeah, even earlier in the early second century, Pliny's letter, the Pliny, Pliny the Younger, Roman governor Bithynian Pontus writes to the emperor Trajan, and he says, I, I've been, he's investigating the Christians. He says, I've interrogated two women who are called, and he uses a Latin word, ministri, which is a, a literal equivalent of diaconos in the female form there, plural diaconos. And so uh, even he is giving indications that that in the early first century, you have this use of the term for some women. Um, the question is, he, you know, what does it mean to them? We don't know. He doesn't tell us anything more about these these women. Uh, but this is two generations after St. Paul has written his letter to the Romans about it uh, and uh, 50 years. Uh, and that's and it's and it's the 50 years in which we go from apostles and elders to bishops, priests and deacons. You know, the church is evolving and and the and 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 by the end of the century end of the first century you have this triad that we're all familiar with and so by the time that Pliny is interrogating these women deacon means an office in the church and yet it still had a, a an informal use i see and, and, and certainly in this case does appear to have been applied to these women so so that ha actually it happens gradually with the evolution of the church but the, the persistence of this name and the fact that it's right there in scripture, you know, looks like it has apostolic authority. And people are just going with it and assuming, oh, well, this is OK. Now, they did put strict limits on it. Even the didascalia strictly limits what a deaconess can do. So she's not a deacon. There is nothing to argue for the equivalence of female deacons and male deacons. As, Saint, as Father John, in talking about the ordination of deacons and deaconesses, probably point out some of the differences there. Uh, interesting. One of the interesting ones is that the uh, in the prayer for the deacon, it says that the deacon has been called by God to this office. Whereas uh, in the prayer for a deaconess, it doesn't say anything like that. It says, since she's offered herself for service there. So on one hand, you have a man who's actually been called by God to an office. On the other hand, you have the church saying, since you're offering to work for the church, we'll let you do that. 
So big difference there. Um, and I would argue it's a, it's a later right and it's a, essentially a monastic right uh, because that's what ultimately what deacons became. They became uh, senior nuns, uh, monks. Um, and uh, and in fact, with the development of monasticism among women, it sort of it did see indeed a, a, a diminishment of the office of deaconess. Uh, they were no longer really needed. And uh, we had nuns now. And in fact, even even in the Dita Scalia, if you didn't have a deaconess, any pious woman could do what a deaconess was called to do. And that's not the case with deacons or priests, for that matter. Uh, you know, you can't just let laymen do what deacons and priests do. But you could let a lay woman do what a deaconess does. Another key difference there that there's no equivalence. Nevertheless, the name, the name is, is what they were stuck with. And it did contribute to the, their standing in the church in the East where they were using that. Uh, and, and even today, it's the name that the advocates want. They want to create really a wholly new office that does nothing of what the early deaconesses do. Yeah, well, that's the that's that's the key point here. Where um, you know, I have some friends in the Roman Catholic world; they're very educated, and we were talking with Tim Gordon about this uh, not too long ago, and he was pointing out that in the Roman Catholic world, what the decision was to do in a lot of these cases was try to create a sort of new thing that's a that's a midway. So you have a layperson, and then you have the ministerial priesthood or the you know being ordained and then now you could create this deaconess office which is a new thing this kind of like well it's kind of like a midway thing that then becomes kind of the gateway the the wedge putting the foot in the door to then say well well wait a minute now if we've already admitted a quasi um you know priesthood for uh, a deaconess why can't they just be a, a priest and then by extension a bishop yeah yeah yeah, because basically what they're doing is pushing for the sacrifice of the principle. And once you sacrifice the principle, then everything else is just incremental. It's just a matter of, well, applying the new principle, which is equality for women and, add, and pushing women into more and more places there. Uh, you know, when I was writing about women in the military, uh, I've written a couple of books on that, speaking about that years ago, 30 years ago, a long time. Uh, but I, the same thing happened there. Is oh, wow. They, they would argue for ever ever more narrow definitions of combat. Uh, and then and then and then when they would get it to the point where, well, gee, they're, you know, you practically put women in combat, feminists would turn around and saying, well, see, women are already in combat. And so, so why do we have this exclusion? That's exactly it. That's the argument they make. So it's a sort of I remember St. Basil says something like, you know, many heretics trip up on word concept fallacy. So you can take a word that's perhaps used in a general sense, and if you're uh, you know, cunning or deceptive or yourself confused, you can be right. duped into thinking that, well, that word always means the same thing in every context, right? A lot of, a lot of errors uh, pop up this way, especially in Trinitarian Christological disputes. So this, yeah. this makes sense that it would, it would happen here as well. One thing I was a little unclear on now you were saying um, post the Discalion and post uh, the, the sort of uh, identification of the two senses of the word in that text that it encouraged how, you said that the men, like the women having a servant function was very widespread or women having a deaconess ministerial priesthood role was very widespread. That was just a little unclear from what you were saying. Oh, well, no, the, I mean, the, the general sense of uh, uh, a, a diakonos um, and, and in Greek, there is it's it's it, it's a male uh, noun. But uh, the only way you can distinguish, if you apply it to a woman, the only thing you do different is you give it a female article. Uh, and so it's the same word. And um, but but the general sense of being a trusted servant. Yes, there were many women who were trusted servants. There were many women helping out in various ministries and doing great work. I have no doubt. And of course, you know, we we all know women like that. You know, if you're part of any active parish, you know, women who are very involved. Um, but did they have any kind of ordination? Did they have any kind of sacramental duties? Um, all, did they were they doing what deacons did? No, 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 they didn't. They were there's severe limits, strict limits on what they did. And and this is this is what made a female diaconate possible, because if if they tried to have women do uh, what male deacons did, 
they'd have been labeled heretics. And in fact, some did. Some mm -hmm. heretical sects, like the Montanists, did have their deaconesses doing lots of things that, uh, you know, are reserved for men. And so they were just labeled as heretics. And that's exactly the complaint made in the West, because the West, the West was not reading Romans in Greek. And, and they didn't, they weren't reading that Phoebe was a diakonos. They were reading that Phoebe was a minister, yes. which meant simply a trusted servant, uh, or that she was in some ministry. And that, that's the word ministerio is the word in the Vulgate uh, and the Vetus Latinus, the earlier Latin translations of the Bible. They, uh, that's, that's, that's what they understood, that she, oh, she's a woman working in a ministry or working in ministry uh, and, and not an officer of the church. And so they never had a tradition of deaconesses. And they were appalled when they found out, found out that there were deaconesses in the East. They were still denying it in the mid fourth century there. Uh, and began blaming it on on heretics there. So um, yeah, it's um, uh, it, it's a curious story of the way this happened. The problem for uh, for those who do believe that it was an apostolic office is that well, if it was it, if it was apostolic, why didn't the West get any? Why didn't they know that there were deaconesses? I mean, Saint Paul, after all, wrote Romans to the Romans. He told them that Phoebe was a diaconal. Yeah. They didn't get this idea that she was a deacon of the <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. That's a yeah, it's a really strong argument. Um now you mentioned uh, a minute ago Origin, uh, to broaden this a little bit. You know, Origin had a lot of uh Platonic, Neoplatonic influence. A lot of people have said basically that his uh, his approach, his worldview is Neoplatonism with a Christian veneer. I think that's pretty uh, accurate from what I can tell I've read um, a decent amount of origin and different different texts uh, and you have a very um, I think accurate critique as far as I can tell of kind of a lot of the erroneous assumptions behind originism from the philosophical domain a lot of metaphysical assumptions and it probably plays into this I don't know your thoughts on this but I would assume that probably you take the approach that the errors that uh, origin would have in terms of anthropology and kind of giving a primacy to um, some sort of unity that's above the male female distinction is something that uh, Christianity somehow has as its as its ethos. We're going to evolve past male and female uh, in the eschaton. We'll be spheres again. You know something ridiculous like this where we're not marked out as male and female. Does origins anthropology and philosophy relate to? the uh, the issue at play here with deaconesses yeah i don't i don't know uh, I, I really rather doubt since it was sort of already ongoing by the time he enters the picture and begins writing about it i don't think that he's really the uh, can be blamed for the 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 office coming up and when it comes up it's pretty well uh, clearly defined as an office for women and yeah. very great women. Well, let me let me rephrase that i don't right. mean in the historical sense of it because yeah. you're saying the dispute is certainly oh. prior to that but yeah. let me let me like in the mindset of people pushing it today is oh, yeah, there yeah. is there a commonality Absolutely. with using origin in this way oh yes and 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 even in even long ago um you could see that uh, that those who thought that way those who thought that male and female was something to be transcended completely uh would be inclined to towards a more egalitarian uh, idea towards women. Now we don't hear of this, that uh, particular application or consequence uh, from any father except maybe Saint Gregory of Nyssa uh, in his uh, in right. his life of uh, Saint Macrina the younger, his sister. Um, he uh, he makes a comment in, in telling why he's writing her life is that he doesn't think it's quite right that a, a woman so pious should have to go through life veiled and silent. Now, that sounds a lot like a criticism of the church tradition, apostolic tradition, actually. But he's the only one that goes there. And uh, and yet you have this idea, this expectation that, well, oh, transcending gender, um, you know, it, it did a, it did continue to affect uh, uh, Christian thinking on monasticism, uh, on eunuchs, uh, confusing things, I would say, really confusing them because there were saner understandings of both of those subjects. Uh, but nevertheless, it does sort of linger in the thinking of uh, of many Christians for a long time there. And it's been resurrected. And that's the problem now. It's all been resurrected. And now we're using St. Gregory. Now, some people are using St. Gregory of Nyssa and St. Maximus' Confessor, especially to to argue for 
um, oh, well, yeah, you know, an overthrow of the binary of male and female. Really, that's what some of them really are all about. And feminism does that. You know, feminism begins with the denial of the difference of male and female, saying male and female is not, it doesn't matter. You know, it's not significant. Yeah, that was my next question was to ask you about the role of, uh, you know, modern feminist ideology in these movements and in these uh, ideological pushes, because I know you were saying, well, you looked at this and saw this in the military uh, for many years. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience in that regard, because that's fascinating. I, I didn't know that you had that background about studying um, you know, women in combat. I was just talking about that a couple of uh, streams back and how they pushed a lot of uh, movies actually and, and propaganda, uh, mm -hmm. getting women to come into and trying to get into these roles. Movies like G.I. Jane with uh, Demi Moore. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Hollywood. Hollywood women. Exactly. Oh, they're all superheroes, you know. So um, I, well, I'm old enough that I remember a much saner world. Uh, I was born in 58 and I, and I have to say, uh, Gee, uh, all the principals I knew in school were male. Um, all that, I, 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 uh, firefighters were all male. Policemen were all male. Uh, the, the U.S. military actually reached its lowest percentage of women since World War II in 1967. Um, and uh, oh, and you know, early in the 60s, there was a there was a, a board game for children called Careers. It was sold in male and female versions, you know, different careers. That was the assumption. And of course, it all began changing in the 70s uh, with uh, the Equal Rights Amendment and feminism and the you know, admission of women to the uh, service academies. Um, and, uh, you know, I hadn't actually thought much about the issue until uh, I was in first year college, actually. And uh, I stumbled across a book. I've written about this recently on my blog. I stumbled across a book in 1977 called Sexual Suicide, written by George Gilder. Gilder went on to be a best-selling author, but, uh, but Sexual Suicide was not a bestseller. In fact, he was pretty much pilloried for it. He got some attention, but not favorable. Uh, and yet his basic argument was that women have enormous power over men, so much power that men will live their entire lives and even die for women, uh, live their lives in order to have a wife and have children. And, and die for that wife and child if necessary. Um, and in fact, that's what that's what we're called to do. That's what St. Paul says in Ephesians 5. Yeah. The man is to let, give his life for the wife as Christ gives her life for the church. Um, and um, and that's that's deeply theological, actually. And you know, I, I could get into that later, but um, but this is something or in reading about reading Gilder in the 77, it just sort of opened my eyes. And I realized, oh, that's you know, that's uh, that's in a sense what the way things work, um, and 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 of course, if women have this great power over men, social power, you can't give them all the other power too. Um, uh, you know, they're not going to be want to uh, live and die for for their wives if their wives are completely beyond their control. You can't expect anybody to be you know to be responsible for somebody uh, if they have no control over it. Um, you know, that's one way of reading when it says in Genesis 3.16, it says it in, in the sentence of Eve, it says, you shall have pain in childbirth and your, your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. Well, yeah. One way of understanding that ruling over you is that he's taking charge of you to care for you. Yeah, that's what I've always thought of. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, he's taking response. He has now the responsibility for caring for you. But you but I felt this way in the military. Sometimes I was put in a position where. I was responsible for things, but I didn't have any control over it. And that's not a good feeling. And you can't expect that of people. And so if you're going to make the man responsible for the woman so that she can raise children, then you have to give the man some say in how they live, the, the ultimate say in how they live. Uh, it's not a, a terrible subjection. As St. John Chrysostom says, the subjection is but slight. And nevertheless, there is also there is an order, as St. John Chrysostom also says, uh, for with us, the woman is reasonably subject, subjected to the man for equality of honor causeth contention there. That's always been the teaching. Um, it's just that's the Christian way. It makes sense. It's way of societies have always been ordered. Uh, Christianity uh, makes it much more tolerable for women. Um, I, and yet what we see now is, is a complete abandonment of that among many Christians. You know, people aren't taught that. Uh, children, when they're told the story of Adam and Eve, they leave out that part about your turning shall be and he shall renew. They don't even mention that. And so uh, and if you don't mention these things to people, if you don't raise uh, people with this understanding, 
before long, they're just going to rebel against it. And that's what we see today. Yeah, well, these rebellion, uh, these rebellions are all connected because you got, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I thought you were at the end of that. It's a, there's a brief delay. Um, the, uh, you know, pretty much every area of intense subversion relates back to this rebelling against um, what's natural, right? To use a, in a general theological sense, not, not, you know, not in a Thomistic sense, but in the sense of, you know, what God has designed for our natures and for men and for women. The rebellion of feminism is very close to the rebellion uh, of what we see with the trans um, phenomenon today. Oh, yeah. All of these are, re are related because the idea is that somehow equality equates to a, a rebelling against boundaries and norms. And that has really nothing to do with equality. But it's weaponized and it's tied to the revolutionary ideas of liberalism, communism, postmodernism, all of the isms basically have this impetus within them to really uh, function in a kind of a satanic way. At least that's what it seems to me. It's everything's inverted. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I read another book actually called The uh, Eight Ways to Run the Country. Uh, it's a work of political theory, but descriptive political theory. It doesn't tell you what to believe about politics. It just tells you why other people believe what they do. Uh, and who agrees with whom by you know, fundamental principles. Uh, but one of the things I point out is that in the modern age, the modern age is ultimately an age of anarchy. It's all about rebellion. It begins, of course, with the rebellion against church authorities, hierarchy, yes. which leads yeah, eventually to a rebellion against political authorities, monarchy. And, it, and then it culminates in our own day with a rebellion against uh, social uh, family authority or patriarchy. Um, that's, that's that's what it's all about. It's all fun, fundamentally satanic uh, because you, you've got and, and it's right in the fall. It's in the story of the fall with the serpent tempting Eve to turn away from the man who is her source in her head. You know, she's created from him and she gets everything from him. You know, the, the, the animals are all named before the woman is created. She gets their names from Adam. And yet the source of her being, she is turns away from in order to follow the serpent. And then Adam does the same thing. He turns away from his source God, and yeah. follows the woman there. And that's why the the this, the prophecy when it says, it actually says, you know, it's commonly translated as your desire shall be to, to, to your husband and he shall rule over you. Um, but in the Septuagint, it, it, well, in the Hebrew, the word for desire is sort of a desire, but it, it, it literally means sort of a stretching forth towards. And in the Greek, the word is apostrophe. And it, it means a little something a little different. It means you're turning back, shall be, to the to the man. So in a sense, you know, she has turned wrongly towards the serpent, away from the man. So her turning back will be towards the man, and he's he'll take responsibility for you for the sake of the survival of the two and the human race there. So, but that's what the 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 uh, the, the modern world is all about. Uh, wokeness is all about a grievance blaming somebody else for our problems uh, and and declaring our, our ultimate authority, complete autonomy from any givens in life. You know, we don't even have to pay attention to our biology, we can be whatever we want to be, be, define ourselves in any way we want to, and then force other people to go around with it. I mean, it's yeah, it's, it, it has that victim mentality side of it, but then it also has that revenge Oh, positive yeah. side to it where people feel that they're justified in doing whatever they can to ruin other people's lives, get them yeah. fired, attack them, and even in some cases engage in violence uh, in terms of wokeness. So, you know, it's it's getting really intense and crazy. Um, do, you, do you believe that kind of where I was going with that point about rebellion, you know, even pa past the attack on the family, it's almost like is the, is the rebellion now even going to the point of attacking our own very nature and biology do you think i mean is, is it getting that crazy where people will uh in a satanic way not just go against having a family or something like that but we're actually seeing ourselves as an it's almost gnostic where we see ourselves as kind of inherently evil for being male or female or even having a body yes you know the the the, the core of not ancient gnosticism uh, and even modern gnosticisms uh is is this desire this this impatience with the way things are 
and a desire to escape reality, escape this world and, and, and transcend it and end up in some other way. And the Gnostics of the ancient world practice, they had fantasies about how this all, how we all came to be in this terrible way. And then, and then they had rights, mystical rights that would draw us out of that, you know, that, that would uh, share the gnosis with us so that we'd become one of the knowing few. There's a vanity involved in this too. Um, but that's what we're seeing now is we have people who are terribly suffering just because they're human beings. And I'm terribly confused as to what that's about, and of course blaming others for it and and seeking for some escape, but it's ultimately always a murderous escape. And that's that's how you end up with the gulags. That's how you end up with genocide of all forms. There, it's a, 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 a the Gnostic forms. It's a murderous escape from reality as as it is. Uh, and and when you reach the point where you allow people to choose whether they're boys and girls, and force people to go along with it, force parents to allow children to do that. Well, what could be more wicked? I mean, really, our Lord himself says uh, that, that for, for people who abuse children like that, maybe a millstone around the neck's not the, not the worst thing for them. Um, so, and, yeah. and And by the way, the people that are complicit in um, maybe not directly doing it, but promoting the idea, right? Oh, yeah. Or at, like at a corporate level, for example, where corporations are sort of trying to force people to admit to this collective delusion, which is yeah. just insane, right? But we all know it's not true, but it's a sort of a struggle session, humiliation ritual where, oh, well, do you want to keep your job? Because, you know, AR, HR department is going to, you know, make yeah. you go along with this or something like that. So, it's getting really uh, wild. Um, I, I know you have a lot of history of studying, uh, you know, the, the Cold War, these kinds of um, historical uh, processes and phenomena. Does any of that relate? Do you think any of the, the geopolitical elements of what we went through uh, between the East and the West and the Cold War and kind of where we've come to with the, the post-Cold War world where we are, where it's kind of uh, I don't know what to call the world that we're going into. How, how would you, I mean, Huxley describes it, you know, in, in his text that we've lectured through as kind of the final revolution. Like we're kind of at this final phase of the revolution, which he says is against man himself. Um, how, how would you describe it in kind of a historical geopolitical setting? Is there any relevance to, you know, the things that you studied, uh, you know, for example, communist ideology in the cold war or something like that? Well, you know, um, that's, in a sense, uh, eight ways to run the country, the book of political theory does sort of carry this out because uh, because one of the corners there is indeed just uh, running off with uh, reality, really, um, uh, or away from it. And um, and there's no end to that, really, other than the destruction of a society. Um, uh, clearly, uh, it, it's it's the, the, the sexual obsession uh, with absolute freedom of sexuality, uh, ultimately pedophilia as well, and the sexualization of children to prepare the way for that. Um, that is that is so, uh, so dominant, uh, in, in ascendant, at least. And, um, and, and yes, there are so many forces going along with it. Uh, and, and uh, I, one of the part of the problems is, is that, well, the, you know, this idea of transhumanism, again, the idea that you can, we can sort of make ourselves whatever we want. And now you can do that when there is no God. Um, and that's ultimately behind all of this. Nobody sees any reason to to live by any lim limits that they find inconvenient because it's all a matter of what you can get away with. And if you can get away with forcing people to live the way you want them to live, well, then that's what ought to be done because the only God that these people know is themselves, their, their own sick souls. Um, and it ultimately does... It's got, it can only become more murderous. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, we're struggling with immigration now, and I think it's a, 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 the, the obvious reality is that nations cannot survive uh, large numbers, masses of people coming in. Um, but one wonders, I wonder, all these masses of people, are they going to be quickly turned into wokesters also to perpetuate the civilization? Oh, yeah, I think so. Or are they going to? Well, maybe, but, but it may be that they're simply over, that the wokesters are simply overwhelmed and, and nature sort of writes itself with people who are just not quite as insane. Um, and, well, I wonder, though, if they don't usually what happens with immigrants is that maybe the first or sec maybe even the second generation, right. you know, they, they retain some of their... Um, 
yeah. nor, nor, normalcy or, or you know healthy. But then the, it's the younger generation that's specifically targeted yeah. to be the you know the really radical tip of the spear yeah. type. But this is a real gamble. I mean, you take, think in terms of, of Muslim immigration. Uh, this is I mean the strategy is the, the plain strategy that you can see written is uh, is among the, the on the left is to of course take a very benign view of Muslims and welcome them among us to to of course pacify them and and of course to go along with the more liberal Muslims and saying that the, the jihadists are actually a minority uh, and and that that's not real Islam that's the gambit of uh, the the woke scholars. Um, when it comes to is Islamic immigration there. And, and yet, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and certainly not with Islam. Uh, there are aspects of Islam that- That's that, a good point, yeah. Yeah, that, that will, that, that basically are going to, and actually this is true with a lot of religions, it's the hard core that defines a religion. The hard core keeps it alive. Um, yes, you can lure away uh, a lot of other people into any different directions, but uh, but there is always going to be a hard core. And when that hard core is violent and very committed and also prolific, having lots of children, there's no way that you're going to be able to assimilate them and wake them up in that way. Yeah, um, I always think that that's would you say that applies maybe more to Europe in, in the West? Uh, does, or or yeah. do you think that Probably. are we are we in, in America even getting more and more Islamic? Well, yeah, that, yeah uh, we certainly see it in D.C. here. Um, uh, yeah, but I was thinking more in terms of, uh, in, in a sense, the dynamic is the same, uh, except that, of course, Europe is, is definitely a, a lot closer to the Muslim world. And you see it, we see it very, clear, very clearly happening there. So you're going to have a woke, you're going to have a Muslim Europe, really. And it's not going to be woke, ultimately. All this wokeism is going to leave Europe when, when the Muslims take over. Uh, here, that's not going to happen, um, but but it does re it does hold out some hope that uh, all the other immigrants that are coming in may not be able to uh, be assimilated as quickly. Also, uh, because wokeism will will be in decline anyway from Europe and everywhere else, uh, and yeah, thing, I, things, things are changing. changing so. Uh, yeah, well, maybe in America, they just want to bring in all these people to just have an absolute just collapse of the system. I don't know. I, the, the logic of it, uh, I keep going back and forth as to whether there's tremendous incompetency or just like totally devious cunning to, <laughs> to completely collapse yeah, the country. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I wonder about that, too. I, 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 some, some, I'm sure there's some who, yeah, just want to destroy things. But, uh, but there are a lot that just sort of, they, they buy into an ideology and all they can do is implement the ideology. Uh, I mean, I've had conversations with, um, with people I know who are into that. And uh, you can reason with them for a while until they realize, oh, this is going in a direction which violates the ideology, violates the, you know, the fundamental principles, and they'll just abandon logic at that point. Exactly. And, and assert things. Um, yeah. And deny that they said anything that would be considered, you know, racist, sexist, whatnot. Uh, wh whereas, in fact, they had. Uh, just in reasoning things out, at least in, from their their perspective. Here's uh, a question. So, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm done. Well, I was going to go back to the uh, the the yeah, we'll issue talk about with deacons, deaconess, excuse me, because uh, first thing that pops in my head as we've talked about this that is odd is where where was this issue in 1600? Where was this issue being brought up and debated in the year 1300? Uh, where was this in uh, 1850? I mean, this, why is this suddenly now like, oh, we have to resurrect and deal with this topic? Uh, you know, I mean, it, wouldn't this have been in dispute if this was a really obvious, clear role for women to be in? No, yeah, that's a thing. I mean, uh, this is a, it, the, the, the argument that the advocates of deaconesses make is it's really a very odd one for Orthodox um, because they were so grounded in tradition. And, uh, and yes, you know, there was a tradition in some parts of the church a long time ago to have deaconesses, but that's not the tradition now, it hasn't been for a thousand years. And, and there are good reasons for that. But, um, but yeah, it's really only come, come uh, up now uh, as a sort of late reaction, very late reaction to all of the change in the Western world in the last several hundred years, uh, leading to, of course, you know, outright feminism in, in the 18th century. Um, and uh, and which was affecting churches there. You know, you were there were 
there were there were many many more sects were were putting women in uh, uh, positions, uh, leadership positions and whatnot, and and there was uh, and some had deaconesses. Now, of course, they had deaconesses that were very different from what are, is being pushed now. Um, the Lutherans and the Episcopals had deaconesses. It was really more like a, a Peace Corps for women, um, single women who could sign up and 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 go do charitable work in some place um, or um, uh, evangelical work someplace. Um, and and it was a, a form of service. Uh, they were called deaconesses, but but they nobody really thought of them as deacons in that. Uh, and, and that's that's how uh, I meant to say a while ago. That's that's why uh, deaconesses didn't really weren't really seen as too problematic uh, where they existed, um, because there were there were tight limits on them, and the danger of feminism just wasn't there, and so it didn't seem nearly the problem that that somebody had to make a stand against it. Uh, although there is evidence that the church in many parts it was not comfortable with it, it's even where there were deacons, it's even in the East. And and eventually it died out because bishops just decided, no, we don't want these. We don't need them. We don't want them. Uh, and, and it might have been because, well, they, they really didn't like this idea of having clergy women, of having women in charge in the church. And that's the problem. And, you know, the fundamental inherent problem of deaconesses, uh, even when they existed, was it, it seems to elevate men or women over men in the hierarchy of the church. Uh, if they're clergy, well, then they're over the laity. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, it was a tolerable problem when uh, they were confined to monasteries. They were basically nuns. Uh, then it wasn't such an issue. Uh, but but if you had them in, in parish life there, and if you gave them too much honor and too much authority, um, well, it, it could upset the natural order. And people were keen on that and uh, and did what they had to do in order to protect the the order, the way things ought to be there. Um, and lately, of course, um, the move is to just simply abandon that because well, the advocates of it don't believe in differences between men and women. Really. Yeah. Well, they do believe in differences. They do believe in, in uh, motherhood as distinct from fatherhood. Uh, but a lot of them will say they see no theological reason why a woman can't be a priest. Yeah, well, one of the individuals, for example, one of the um, females that is pushing this, who comes from the Roman Catholic world, uh, put up on a, a large prominent site that she had just spoken, quote, to her Catholic priest about this phenomenon. She's talking about her experience of trying to get this in the Roman Catholic world when she was in the Roman Catholic world before supposedly converting to Orthodoxy. The priest told me that in the Catholic Church, at first, there was a lot of pushbacks against uh, girl altar servers. However, organically, parishes allowed from a bottom-up approach more and more girls to begin to serve at the altar. Supposedly, at first, it was through the excuse of the need to do so because, oh, we don't have enough young guys that will serve. We're going to have to use women. At some point, the practice, practice then eventually became an official blessing that came from Rome, and the Roman church allowed this uh, on the grounds that the altar server uh, does not necessarily lead to priesthood. I found this as a good argument, considering that not all altar boys want to become priests. And so her point in all this passage is that it's a technique and a tactic of incrementalism. And she saw it successfully in the Roman Catholic Church. And and you might say, well, but there aren't Roman Catholic uh, female priests. Well, yeah, but they're moving in the direction of that. And that's part of the purpose yeah. of the recent Fiducia Supplicans document is to introduce the new third status the, the new uh, in-between status of, well, it's not gay marriage. It's a blessing for two people yeah. in it. So they, they take, it's it's like a, it's an invented new category that is the stepping stone is the key. Yeah, yeah I'm glad, glad you raised this. Uh, of course, the Roman Catholics, they do have Eucharistic ministers who are female uh, and chanters, actually. You know, I was uh, attended a baptism of a friend of mine's uh, son at a Catholic church um, several years ago. And and all the singing was done by a woman, really. Uh, she pre pretty much sang everything except for a few responses that the people did. Um, but, you know, we have that problem in the Orthodox Church. And and and, and here's where it's like, in a sense, uh, in a sense, some of us who are against Dickinesses are kind of relieved at, well, you know, the, the AFR documentary because it didn't really go in the way that the advocates wanted. Um, but, of course, they have other demands. 
and one of them and they're at and they're actively at work and they're and they're working with um greek clergy to come up with ways that that girls women can do more in church and that's going to be their strategy and this is harder to protect against unless you just plainly say no because well you know you can vent all kinds of things and and you've seen it you know they'll have women holding the cloth at the chalice um uh, they'll have um you know girls yeah. uh, cutting the bread the prospero instead of having it done by the servers uh or uh, standing guard over the plush denitsa the epitaphion at pasca um you know russian scouts and they're both male and female and they will stand guard there in unity they have women girls and youth teenage girls in uniform standing guard in church like that um that's uh, uh oh and and that's that's not to mention the fact that well in some churches they already have women women reading the epistle um they've already given up on that um not done until the 20th century and uh maybe in the late 20th century Oh, wow. um, but, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of churches have given up on that being a male role. Uh, and yet the uh, the tonsuring right for a reader is that this is the first step to the priesthood. Uh, oh, and of course, wow. okay. and, yeah. And, it, and if you're used to hearing a woman read the epistle on Sunday morning, why can't she read the gospel? What's the difference? Um, yeah, you, you just completely confuse it. Uh, this is something we we did point out in the public statement on Orthodox deaconesses um, that uh, I drafted with um, with the help of uh, Father Peter Hears and Father Alexander Webster uh, in uh, 2027 or 2017, and then published in 2018. Uh, we included a mention of this danger um, of um, generational um, um, loss, in a sense, um, that we have to take generational generation generationally. <laughs> That 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 uh, that girls or women who have grown up uh, in churches with female readers will be more likely to yeah. think only of deaconesses, and those who grow up in churches with deaconesses will be more likely to accept female priests. Yes, um, because they, they've already blurred the difference there. They, nobody's teaching them a principle to 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 reserve these roles for men. Uh, in fact, their principle is we need to let women do more. We need to be make them equal. Oh, oh, and the example, you know, another example, the churching of infants there. You know, it, in this sexually confused world where people are denying the binary, this was a teaching opportunity to uh, church them differently and take the, the 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 male child through the altar to make the point that that's his response, that's the responsibility of men. And this this makes the point not only for the for the child or the parents, it makes a point for everybody. Uh, it makes the point to adult men that this is something you should be doing you should be serving in this way um and and yet we have uh, quite a few people in quite a few jurisdictions who just well they've they decided oh we don't need to do that we can be nice to women and be equal and make a feminist point which is to deny the difference of male and female and church them the same way and that's what people are doing there yeah. you know this is, I, I, if anything really upsets me on this issue is the gutlessness of so many priests so many male priests they cannot stand up to the women they're just so afraid of the women they can't speak the truth they dodge when they have to they just dodge addressing the question or they make concessions they try always to compromise in some way and they give ground in doing so they just won't they they behave like adam basically they follow the woman and what we need and that's why we're in the situation we're in actually but what we need is men who will stand up and be men and speak the truth we cannot expect women to save themselves that's the preference oh yeah we'd like to have female scholars do the argument make the argument for us that's how, what a lot of them are thinking no that's not really going to save us we need men to make this argument men to take the lead the women will follow it's not such a bad truth really when you explain it right but men have to take the lead on this and, and really be men and not be Adam. Yeah, that's a great point. That leads me to a question. And, and uh, this is something that I've seen in other domains. So I don't know about specifically this area, this domain. Um, but I'm asking you if you have any insight or any take on this. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of times there's a lot of um, wealthy foundation money, NGOs. These will put money into certain agendas being pushed. 
And I think sometimes with, for example, uh, the archons and people like that putting money into different things, do you know or do you have any any uh, insight on whether foundation money is being uh, pushed here in the Orthodox world in regard to this issue to get eventually women priests? And, you know, I never really looked at that. I've assumed that's the case, and you can see plenty of evidence of it. Uh, a year ago, um, I attended the, uh, the uh, well, it was, it was supposed to be an, uh, not an annual meeting because they haven't been able to meet annually. It's a new group, the International Orthodox Theological Association. Uh, and because of COVID, they couldn't meet annually. But they did meet last January in Volos, Greece, um, about halfway between Athens and Thessalonica. Um, uh, their, their host was probably the wokest bishop in Greece. Um, and it was quite, oh, I was amazed. This is a theological conference. They had money. They had published programs, four color, glossy. It was, it, they gave us all copies of their own rather woke translation of the New Testament. Um, I, I was surprised. I thought it was probably a lot of it foundation money, probably a lot of it government money, U.S. government money. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or Greek government. Um, yes, uh, it, you, that's without a doubt. I mean, as I say, I've not followed the money, but I've seen the money spent and it, it was a lot. And it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the world is definitely all on their side. It's part of their attempt to subvert the church, to subvert real Christianity. You know, that part of the strategy of pacifying the Muslims is is also um, censoring the Christians and getting them oh, to shut absolutely. Up yeah. about these differences. Yeah. So it's yeah, in fact, the, the early Fabians in the in the in Britain in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, they actually said that their hope was that if they did gradually bring islam into at that time london and then england and then the rest of europe they hoped that it would have the effect of displacing christianity and its influence um oh, really? yeah, yeah for the purpose they thought yeah. of they, they thought that they could liberalize at that time they may have changed their their attitude later yeah. but they thought at that time they could liberalize the idea of the prophet muhammad and turn it into a kind of a democratic movement so they claimed um but i yeah, think that, I guess I th that shouldn't surprise me but uh but yeah i didn't know that yeah well i think i speak it speaks to your point that no you're not ultimately going to liberalize all of the you know islamic world into some democratic yeah. uh you know get happy sing along get along um the more that you that i've learned about islam the more i have come to see that um so now your books, uh, you've got Origins of Revenge uh, on the website that's linked. You've also got the, the Deaconess book. Um, and you've got your other books that I didn't know about. Uh, do you want to go ahead and move towards taking some of the questions from the audience? Is that okay? Oh, sure. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, before we do that, is there any other points you oh, want to leave us with? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Actually, I don't hear you. You cut out for a second, so uh, just start over with that last point you're making. Okay. Uh, there was actually, we didn't get to uh, what, one thing I would really like to talk about because it does sure. go to the core. Uh, you can hear me now? Yeah, you're good now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and that's that, uh, you know, we, have, we need a better way uh, of explaining the difference of male and female and relating it to... Um, to um, all of these, well, relating it to ultimately to God, um, the uh, and, and we haven't had that way. Uh, the, the fathers themselves were, of course, they knew religions that were with very sexual gods, and they didn't want any of that, of course. Um, and yet, uh, the, one of the first things we're told about man is that in the, in the image of God made he him, male and female made he them. Uh, and then we have analogies drawn by the Holy Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 and, and then also in Ephesians 5, where he relates the man and the woman to God, to the Father and the Son uh, in a, a 1 Corinthians 11, and then to Christ and the church in uh, Ephesians 5 there. So, so there is a relation there. And the question is, what is it? Um, the, uh, the, uh, an easy way to do it, and some Protestants do this actually, is simply to to take, adopt a, a subordinationist understanding of God. You know, you have the father and then you have the son. It's a ranking or, uh, you know, relationship. Um, and and the 
rank, or the ranking of the man over the woman just reflects that. Uh, that's in Karl Barth. Uh, that's in some other Protestants. Um, but it's not Christian because it, well, it's subordinationism. We can't do that. You know, the son is equal to the father. And we, we were not going to say that. Um, uh, and the ancient world, of course, there, I mean, there is subjection. There is a subjection of the woman as a result of the fall. And, and for the most part, that was sufficient in order to uh, understand the relation, the way men and women should relate. Um, but there is this natural relationship that is not part of the fall. And that's actually what uh, I have argued uh, that St. Paul is talking about in, Ephes in 1 Corinthians 11, where, where he says the head of the woman is the man and the head of the man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. Well, the, the Greek word head very rarely, in fact, only in the Christian age, came to mean the guy in charge. Uh, the Greeks had uh, a dozen other words for the man in charge. Uh, and if you look in the, uh, you know, the, the largest Greek lexicon you can find, the little Scott Jones uh, a lexicon of, uh, of uh, a classical Greek, you'll find not one entry, uh, not one definition of the word kephale, meaning head, meaning the man in charge. It means instead the source of, you know, the beginning of, uh, and in fact, the word kephale for head was used in the Septuagint interchangeably with the word arche, which means beginning there. Uh, what begins, uh, what is the head, or, you know, the, the, things begin with the head. Uh, and in fact, we have this use in, uh, well, in, in, uh, in Septuagint, uh, they were both used to translate the, the, the Hebrew word rosh, as in Rosh Hashanah, meaning the head of the new year, or the beginning of the new year. Uh, we have this use in English uh, in the, uh, the term headwater uh, for the beginning of a river or, or fountainhead, um, a fountain that is the beginning of a stream. Uh, so we have that sense, although it's very limited. And then for the most part, uh, we've adopted the, the, the Roman, the Latin understanding of head, which did mean the Latin word couplet did in ancient times mean the head of something. And we have the word captain, and we have the word chief. And chef and all those come from the same uh, some, the same sense, but that was not the understanding of the word Greek word kephale when Paul was writing First Corinthians, uh, and some of the fathers actually used this. I've seen it in two fathers, uh, Theodore of Cyrus and also here Hilary of Hilary Saint Hilary of Poitiers, where they make uh, an argument for the equality of the son with the father on the basis of the father being the head of the son, the origin of the son, the source of the son. Um, uh, same thing with the man and the woman. There is an equality there between the man and the woman, but there's also a relationship. And the problem in, in relating the man and the woman to the father and the son is we haven't been able to identify, you know, just what's the dynamic going on here. But uh, when in too often times too, every time scholars will think about male and female, they'll think about the, what they know about men and women. And then they'll try to project that on God. And that's where you get yeah. Uh, these attempts to actually say to in a sense make christ the or the son the patron god of men and the holy spirit the patron god of women that's been tried uh, paul of uh, a feminist and, uh, and a sophianist uh in the immigrant community orthodox uh, immigrant community in paris writes a book on this um it appears elsewhere a even uh hansers baltasar von baltasar the roman catholic theologian uh, very influential with uh, john paul ii um, he theorized, he has a similar thing where he says the, uh, the father is masculine. Actually, he uses the term um, super masculine, supra masculine. And the son is supra feminine to the father, or, uh, but supra masculine to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is supra feminine to the son and super masculine to us there. So you get that application of male and female to God. We don't want to do that. Yeah, we That's don't know. The way to go about things is to look at God and then look for similarities. In, in yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's the mistake that Augustine right. and sometimes the Latin West makes about the yeah. Trinity, where you take features of the created order, read that back into the, you know, the, wow. in, the ontological Trinity. It's the other way around, right? It's you start right. with the divine right. and then there might be elements that are present in the created order. After, but, after all, yeah, we are, we all, we, we, Christ is the archetype. Uh, we're all by design taken from him. Uh, and so what you do, what I've done is, is you go to the Gospels. We're told, we're told quite a lot about the Father and the Son in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of John. If I'm a theologian, he's called that because we're told so much about God in that Gospel. 
uh, and you look at how they relate to one another, the father and the son. Uh, and it turns out there are a lot of things where they both do, but it turns out there's some key differences. And the, and the most striking difference and most consistent difference is that uh, all the giving is done by the father and all the thanking is done by the son. Not once is it said that the father thanks the son and not once is it said that the son gives anything to the father except thanks. This defines their relationship, you know, one from the other equal because one is from the other, the one having given all that he has to the other. And, and, and if that's what it means to be one in God, then that's what it would mean for to be one in man, in man, so man, Lord, Lord, yeah. Pray, yeah. When our Lord prays that that I, I pray to you that they may be one, even as we are one. Well, then maybe we're meant to be one by relating to each other in the same way. And in fact, that's the Christian idea for lots of relationships: uh, parents and children, uh, priests and people. Really. Well, what about what about right? the way that we discuss this with Roman Catholics? Right, the idea of bishops amongst other bishops. Right. First among oh, equals. Well, well, but you see, uh, I'm not sure exactly what your point is there and the relevance there. I mean, uh, well, uh, in the church, so we're talking about a sort of a one in many relationship where you have a sort of beginning point, of, uh, a, a fountainhead, as you talked about, yeah. and he might be first, but he's first <laughs> among equals or something like yeah. that. Where you, you about, this sounds like exactly a, our first conversation we had a couple of years ago. Um, you, it, it, I think it's helpful in, in analyzing and looking at this relationship of self-giving and thanksgiving that we not get into the one and the many that you deal with pairs, you know, um, and because that's what we're told when Paul draws this analogy, he only speaks of the father and the son. He doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit uh, and, and he's drawing it to make a point about the man and the woman. And so it's a one to one relationship that, that makes it plainer, although with the priest, uh, what a priest does is in taking the the self-giving role is give his life for the church the way christ does um in serving the church and and that really i have to say is really st quite striking and in in, in rocor i'm just amazed at how much our priests do uh, uh, for being and being priests uh most of them have day jobs and yet they seem to be always in church hearing somebody's uh, confessions blessing somebody's icons or what uh, they give their life for the church. Deacons do also, uh, but to a lesser degree, not much as much expected. Of it. But basically, the uh, the idea of of, uh, of being a member of the clergy is to be the one to give your life for the community. Um, in a Christian sense, that's what rulers are supposed to do. Also, emperors, kings, yeah, presidents. Right. We're, they're all they're seen as in a sense civil servants who give their lives for their people. Um, I already mentioned. Uh, parents um uh, and 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 as it happens between the man and the woman it's the man who's tasked with that self-giving role and the woman who's tasked with that thanksgiving role uh, because you see both of these roles are in christ christ is thanksgiving towards the father but self-giving towards us and so the man uh, by taking or the, or the man and the woman by taking christ-like by imitating christ do so similarly with each each other with the man taking the self-giving role as saint john or saint uh, saint paul talks about in ephesians 5 and the woman taking the thanksgiving role the the eucharistic role so you have the i call it the archic role meaning arche beginning archic role for one and the eucharistic role for the other now they both however uh, in other contexts take the other role as well uh, towards the children the mother takes the archic role the children take the thanksgiving role uh, and the man, well, he's got a boss someplace. He's got somebody over him to whom he's thanksgiving. And of course, between clergy and laity, it's thanksgiving by the clergy or, or self-giving by the clergy, thanksgiving by the laity there. That's how they relate. The laity do things for the church, but they don't have a responsibility for the whole church, the whole flock, whereas the clergy do have that responsibility. They're, they're designated to give their lives, uh, to live for everybody in the flock, in the church. Uh, the lady don't have it. They don't, the, the lady don't have that responsibility. They're responsible only for those that God bring God brings. Yeah. Their way. So I, I see your point that it wouldn't be appropriate to bring in triad because the point of this analogy is yes. from from the from the 
receiver to the beginning point right. or the higher the right. hierarch so to speak yeah yeah, yeah. i, I want to avoid talking about monarchy because um yeah that, that's just not making it's just making a different point a valid point but a different point. different yeah. point gotcha okay but yeah um, it's thanksgiving and, and and if we if we approach and, and this oh and this by the way this is a this is a this is a natural relationship this is the way we are created and, and it makes sense of then that in the image of god made he him male and female made he them this is part of the image of God. We relate to each other in just this way. It's a way we are being God-like. It's a way we are all both being Christ-like as well there. And, um, and, and so it's just fundamental to our being and to our salvation. Uh, and so it in itself is a justification for the clergy, the priesthood being reserved for men. That's an archic role, a self-giving role, and so you don't even need to bring in this the subjection of the woman. The the the, the difference here, you know, the difference between fathers and uh, mothers, or uh, you know, husbands and wives, parents and children, priests and people, is really not a result of the fall at all. It's 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 just a part of our natural being being made in the image of God. And so we don't even have to go there. We don't even talk about the subjection of the woman to actually justify the reserving uh, clerical roles for men. This is the way we should approach this. Um, the woman has her Christ-like role. She's archic at times and Eucharistic at other times. It's just that, yes, you do have to accept the fact that there are a difference in a male and female, and God has specified that uh, part of that difference is, is the man is to take the self-giving role and the woman is to take the Eucharistic role towards the man. Uh, and then And then she then has the responsibility of taking the self-giving archic role towards the children and they respond with the love that she deserves gotcha all right uh we'll ask the audience if you want to support the stream you can and i will uh, donate as you know half of this to uh, father uh, deacon patrick and uh we will uh if you use uh you have to use stream labs if you want to do a super chat we can't do it through youtube as you guys know so that's the link uh, in the chat and the show description and you can open that up uh, the first one is from Matt Beltry since ten dollars says what's up I like your content I'm learning a lot from you I thinking that I might want to move to Romania I was wondering if you've had any experience with Romanian Orthodoxy if so is it different I don't know anything about Romania but I would say Father Deacon uh, Dr. Ananias uh, is close to a lot of the Romanian sector of things and so you could definitely ask him he's been there but I don't I don't know. I mean, maybe you have a, a girlfriend or a wife or something that you, you're wanting to, or a woman, a prospective wife. I don't know why you want to, would want to go to Romania per se, um, but I'm not the person to ask about Romania. But thank you for that. BMX1966, $10. Awesome video. Great stuff, Jay. Thank you so much, BMX. Appreciate that. Longtime supporter and super chatter. Shout out to him. Conrad, $5. I've been attending a Russian Orthodox church for a couple months. I'm considering very seriously converting. I got sick for two weeks after the Sunday liturgy. The first week I got back, I had a car accident on the way to church. Do you think this is a demonic attack? I mean, I do know that everybody who tries to come into the Orthodox Church typically has the experience, not everybody, but most people have the story or the experience that um, it seems like there was a lot of things that happened to prevent me from coming to the church. Um, is that your experience, Father uh, Deacon Patrick, as well? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you've got to persist. You've gotten in a lot of stories told about a men that want to be monk and, and they go, and they make them wait outside for a long time to see if they really want it. Um, yeah. We don't want to rush people in too easily. It, it, it's, it's, it's a serious choice to make. You have to persist in it and really want it. So yeah, yeah. it could be easily demonic. Richard Leon Mole, $5. And then Richard sends another $5. Thank you for that, Richard. Uh, Conrad says again for $5, I watched the coronation of Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople. A lot of representatives from the Catholic Church were present. Apparently, he spent several years studying at a uh, Roman Catholic institution. I don't know which uh, seminary he studied, but this is kind of common. A lot of uh, Orthodox clerics have in the modern period studied at Catholic institutions. Um, I don't know what are you are you asking if that is the case probably i don't know uh patriarch bartholomew's background um is this a coincidence given the ukrainian russian uh church split well technically it's not actually a split it's the state department the cia creating a fake church 
Uh, so there's not really a split. There's a fake made up Orthodox church, which is intended to split the existing church. Um, but um, I think Catholic institutions, unfortunately, can play a role in a lot of this. I think that Catholic institutions in the Ukraine were busy promoting ecumenism and promoting uh, the the fake Orthodox church in, in the Ukraine. Um, I don't know Bartholomew's background, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Father Deacon Patrick, do you think that Western inst uh, institutions, uh, maybe Jesuit universities, does that play a role in kind of pushing a lot of um, papal ideas or, or heterodox ideas in your view? Yeah, I, the, you know, a lot of traditionalists, um, uh, a lot of good Roman Catholics think that, uh, oh yeah, a lot of their institutions are infiltrated by Masons uh, or by just by very worldly people. Uh, and that this is responsible for Vatican II and all that's happened since then. Um, so, um, yeah, a lot of emphasis. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of money probably gone into corrupting these organizations. Uh, they're Now they're getting around to us, uh, although actually they've been working on the Greek church for a long time um, and on the ecumenical patriarch for a while, at least the last hundred years or so. Um, but, yeah, that's a problem, definitely a problem. Conrad sends another $5 and says, what is the purpose or significance of Mount Athos? Do they actually influence our church doctrines? Uh, are they solely there for the ascetic life? And what is the Orthodox position on ongoing revelation? Um, I'll let Father Deacon Patrick answer that. I don't believe that there is any ongoing revelation. I think public divine revelation ceased when the apostles passed. And that's why they said to pass on the deposit of the faith uh, uh, as we read in the New Testament. Um, is this a question for me? About... Yeah, he said, um, how would you describe the purpose or the significance today yeah. of Mount Athos and do they influence I, our teachings and is it just an ascetic thing? No, well, um, yeah, monks aren't just there to save themselves. Um, we might think that, but they're also there to bear witness to the rest of the world. Uh, and Athos does that. Um, uh, although we don't want to think to make the mistake of thinking um, uh, that that Athos is the center of all piety, and that any everything that comes out of it is is exactly what ought to be. Uh, th there are differences among the Athenian monks, and we saw that during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so you can't just trust somebody just because it's Athenian. Um, and uh, they do sometimes, uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, fall victim to other ideas, or they just have their own ideas there. Uh, I'm very skeptical of this, you know, uh, you, there's so many people want to meet the holy man. And uh, so they go to a monastery looking for a holy man. Um, I've never had the experience of meeting a man who who seemed to know more than a man would normally know. Now, I know people who who do see, say they've had that experience. Um, but I know a lot of people who go looking for such a man and don't meet him. Uh, and, and tend also to just take the word of, of monks, um, even very pious monks, as if, well, uh, he said it, therefore it must be true. Um, and and this can be very complicating, when you're especially talking about recent saints, um, because as we see, when you read the lives of the saints, when you read their writings there, saints make mistakes, saints make mistakes. St. John Chrysostom, um, right. not, only did he think, not only did he think that uh, Phoebe was a deaconess, uh, that's a reasonable, I don't believe it's uh, not a deaconess in the way others were later on, but that's a reasonable assumption based upon what he saw and, and what he was re reading. Uh, but he also came to the belief that the, the seven men appointed to handle the daily, daily ministrations uh, in Acts chapter 6 were not deacons. Now, he's the first person that I know of to have said that. Uh, and it was a long time before anybody seconded him. But, but the Six Ecumenical Council, at least at the Council of Trullo in 692, centuries later, oh, somebody raised the point that that's what he said. And so they said, oh, yeah, we'll go with that. Um, and yet the earliest tradition of the church is that, uh, no, the seven were deacons. It's in, it's in the St. Uh, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century. Uh, and the Church of Rome, as well as the Church of Neo Caesarea in, in Asia Minor, both limited their deacons to seven in imitation of the seven. We know that from already the third century, at least. 
Uh, and so, um, so you have you, you have a, a case where it looks like St. John was probably wrong because everybody now sort of accepts that they were they were deacons. Uh, yeah, and, and, many, yeah, that, that's a great yeah. point because yeah. a lot of people kind of get the impression that it's you're impious or you're being oh, yes. oh, li- yes. you're being liberal if you ever doubt or think that any church father got something or a saint got something oh, yeah. wrong. But there are many cases of this. Oh yeah, I, and there are many people who criticize me because well, you know, I said critical things about St. Maximus, yeah. you know. It was a great star and and i i teach saint maximus you know you, you can't catechize people uh really without teaching them logos or, or logos and tropos yeah uh and uh it's so useful um and and uh, and so yeah he's a great saint and a very major saint in terms of contributing to our our thinking but on the issue of male and female he sort of fell back on I, yeah uh, I, I think you're right and yeah yeah, you know, I, I agree with you totally. Uh, and I have a lot of, you know, reverence for St. Maximus. He was a, a big influence on why I converted. Um, but uh, I do think that you're correct that on that issue, he's, he's incorrect because, the you know, the, the literature, the text, he had, he makes these arguments on the basis of, you know, the, the, the sort of Neoplatonic ideas about the primacy of unity over multiplicity. So that's just a fact. Yeah. And I, I think it's contrary to just simply what's in Hebrews. And that doesn't make us unpious to admit you know even saint photius points out that in the mystagogy he says you know well saint, saint augustine got some things wrong and we want to we don't want to highlight and always harp on our father's mistakes <laughs> but it's also not it's not uh honest and it's not coming from a place of piety to pretend like the the never they never made mistakes exactly oh yeah it's an article of faith that that uh, everyone who ever lived other than our lord in this life was not perfect uh, Good point. I mean, even Our Lady was not perfect in this life, uh, and uh, and so, gee, to to act like they are uh, is just uh, not to, to actually uh, believe as Christians have always believed. There, um, yeah. Leon said, Leon zero zero eight three dollars. I am a Black American. Uh, what is all? What has taken place? Maybe reading levels or black men have always lived in a gynocracy or very egalitarian women have always run men through beliefs. Do you think oh, yeah. it would be wise to pay attention? I think he's saying, should we pay attention to what's happening today with um, women being in charge? Is this part of the plan to kind of keep people down, do you think? Does it does it have this effect of um, making society dumber to put women in control, To be to be honest? It does. Um, I, I don't know. Again, I don't know whether, you know, anybody was thinking that far ahead. I mean, there were other designs uh, from the eugenesis uh, about uh, really <clears throat> um, frustrating the black population uh, through, of course, you know, by making it less likely for them to reproduce. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I, feminism, I think, had its own wheels, uh, but it did hijack the civil rights movement uh, and it did move women to the front of the line which made life very difficult for men, black men, black men, because, well, you know, a black female, uh, well, yeah, I mean, she had two things going for her and, and, and white females uh, oftentimes had, of course, the education and the position uh, and the charm uh, so that they, they also uh, can, could make great use of, of the, the civil rights movement uh, and, and really leap ahead of black males. And it did make black males, it made it harder for them to find a productive place in society. Um, it's a terrible shame. Gilder, who wrote the book Sexual Suicide, also wrote a book about that uh, called The Visible Man, uh, published in the 70s also. And it didn't get a lot, it got less attention actually than Sexual Suicide did. Um, but uh, it was, it, it, he, he was very sympathetic to the, the plight of black males who just were abandoned to matriarchy with of course also the the uh, the social policies that um the welfare policies that paid women to have children without men in the home i mean the way it qualified you know they weren't going to give you money public money if you had a, a man in the home so the, the man had to not be there and the woman could actually get present pregnant have a child so that she had an income um terrible 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 policy uh and it's very unfortunate um, that uh, and, and illiteracy is a real problem uh, among black males uh, and, and a real bar to uh, gainful employment as well as a, a real contributor to criminality. Uh, studies have shown that. So. 
Uh, Ortho Bro James, $10. Jay, I'm very grateful for this content. This is great timing for the stream. It is my birthday. I'm an inquirer. Uh, I've been inquiring for a few months now. I hope to attend the Divine Liturgy soon. Thank you for all that you've done. Well, thank you very much, James. Appreciate that. Uh, the books, again, are linked in the chat and in the show description. There is Origins of Revenge and there is the Disappearing Deaconess. Uh, Father Deacon Patrick, is there anything else you want to leave us with before we close it out tonight? Um, no, I want to thank you for the great work you, you do. You know, I, I teach a regular catechism in class and, and, uh, and it just amazes me how many of them have been deeply influenced by your work and, and really credit you with having them brought along into the church. Uh, and I'm sure even though I didn't really tell anybody I was going to be talking to you this evening, I'm sure Sunday morning, somebody will say, oh, I saw you with Jay Dyer because uh, you have a <laughs> And uh, you're in the D.C. area, is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, that's great that's to hear. Good. Yeah, that's good. that's good news. Thank you very much, uh, Deacon Patrick. And everybody, if you would, hit like and share. Remember that we have uh, the show sponsor is Chalk.com, the best in supplementation. Head on over to Chalk.com and use the promo code J50 to get 50% off all of those products like the Tonk Tonk Elite, proven to boost testosterone, the Chad mode, your pre-workout. We want guys in the gym. We want guys uh, disciplined, uh, learning self-control, all those great uh, virtues that help us to be and to live uh, the Orthodox life. So um, everybody, thank you for the stream tonight and I'll see you. Now, guys, remember we have also tomorrow night, Tristan and I will be doing a breakdown of the movie, There Will Be Blood. Uh, we'll be talking about virtue and vice, especially the, the, the virtue or the vice of greed. That's the, the focus, I think, of that movie. I haven't seen it in about 10 years, so it's going to be interesting to go back and review that. Uh, so look for that on his channel tomorrow. Um, also remember to subscribe to me on Rockfin. Um, Father Deacon, I have your uh, blog linked. Is there any other areas or places or, or things you want to point people to other than uh, your, your website? Um, the blog's about it.